Support for Just Seen It comes from Warner Archive Instant. Streaming hard to find movies and TV shows direct from the studio at WarnerArchiveInstant.com. Support for Just Seen It comes from Weaver's Coffee and Tea, makers of hand roasted artisan coffee and hand blended tea. Learn more at Weaver'sCoffee.com. On the next episode of Just Seen It, we review it based on true events, Winnie Mandela. Mandela! You, you're coming with us. Mm. Winnie Mandela is an important story to tell, but does the movie do it justice? The relationship drama, The Door. They're beautiful. They're like young gods. This film really does give us an unbiased look about a pretty taboo subject. And from Fox, we cover the new sitcoms, Dads, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and the new drama, Sleepy Hollow. Fire extinguisher roller chair derby? Okay. Go! Sarp. That's a terrible robot voice. Yep. The next time I see you, I'd like you to be wearing a necktie. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a cop comedy which we haven't had on TV in a while. All right here on Just Seen It. After a strict upbringing, Winnie and Nelson fall in love. South Africa belongs to all those who live in it. When he is jailed for protesting apartheid, Winnie continues his struggle at the risk of her own life. Mandela's dream of a free society will be kept alive. Over the years, she suffers many hardships while trying to free her country in Winnie Mandela. Hi, I'm Sean. Hi, I'm Scott. And I'm Leah, and today we're going to talk about Winnie Mandela, the new film starring Academy Award winning actress Jennifer Hudson. We've all just seen it. What do we think? Woody Mandela is an important story to tell. This is an epic character, but one hour and 47 minutes, not really nearly enough time to really get into the character. And this is just not the film that Winnie Mandela deserved. And the result is an episodic, stitched together movie that just isn't as good as it should have been. Winnie Mandela is a very controversial, incendiary, and important historical figure. And I think you're right that this film really doesn't do it justice. I don't know that I would want it to go any more than a, an hour and 47 minutes, though. Well, that's because the direction of the film, it's very earnest. It's sincere to mm. a fault. Mm. There are big, epic moments in the film, the speeches that Terrence Howard gives as Nelson Mandela, and then eventually that Jennifer Hudson gives as Winnie Mandela. And the speeches should have been powerful enough, but to have this head-beating musical score yes. on top of it, it overstated the obvious, and as a result, I felt like I was being manipulated. We're told how to feel, yeah. It was long and drawn out, yet it didn't really tell us anything. That's the, that's the major problem, I think. I mean, I, and, and seeing Jobs, I think Jobs is a film that kind of has the same problems, which Agreed. is we're talking about a character, but we don't really know what the filmmaker is trying to say about this person. Part of the problem was that it was sprawling. It did try and cover from her birth when this very kind of Lion King and Roots moment <laughs> with the birth of the baby. Yes. So it started with that, and then it leads us up to Truth and Reconciliation. Long period of time, the writers just didn't know where to find the story. Yeah, and the characterizations, I mean, we have her born, and right. her, she has a strict upbringing, at least it suggests she has a strict upbringing. Right. But then we cut to her getting on a bus, and her dad says, I'm actually very proud of you. Why? And then her dad disappears for the rest of the movie. Yeah, we right. don't get the evolution it's of that. Uneven. Right. It's and uneven, And then for sure. Winnie Mandela, she certainly has been involved in some controversial things, right. but they all feel shoved into the last 20, 30 yeah. minutes of this right. movie, 
and she starts out very saint-like. I mean, there's, she's almost a flawless individual in the first hour, right. hour and a half of the picture, and then suddenly it's like, oh yes, there there were some things about her that weren't so great that we <laughs> that we need to have in this movie. Let's just throw them in there. It started as a love story, and I was engaged by the chemistry between Jennifer Hudson and Terrence Howard as Nelson Mandela, but then the, the controversy about Winnie Mandela, which I had a sort of passing knowledge about, mm -hmm. I wanted to know more, and right. I didn't get that from this film. This is a film that was finished back in 2011. Mm -hmm. There was trouble with the production, and then T.D. Jakes came in and kind of rescued the production. And if you don't know, T.D. Jakes is a reverend of a mega church and has this whole production company that's geared and aimed at Christian-themed productions. And it's that kind of move that I think glosses over a lot of the controversial elements of Winnie Mandela, mm -hmm. while at the same time trying to hold her up. I actually did feel that there was a faith-driven undercurrent to the mm, film. Mm -hmm. I could feel it, and I didn't know anything about this background at all. But the, again, flaws aside, it was the performances that won me over oh. because Jennifer Hudson did a great job. It's definitely the most significant big screen performance she's done since she won the Oscar for 2006's Dream Girls. So here's a movie, Winnie Mandela, where she doesn't rely on her musical background at all. Mm -hmm. She gave a convincing enough performance where I was drawn to the character. I was drawn to Terrence Howard as well. He gave a very good performance. I think that you're very forgiving. And I'm sorry, there was just too much of blank cipher going on with her. I liked her for the most part. I, I do think it's difficult to do a South African accent, and she did a good job with the accent. I will say that yeah, that was I she agree. and Terrence both. I don't know how authentic it is, but I know they were consistent. Consistent, And exactly. that was important. There are a couple things I'm wondering. One is, she doesn't seem to age. Even though it's over 60 years, they yeah. seem they put some new hair on her every few years, and then in the last 15 minutes, suddenly she gets some makeup, even though Terrence Howard is obviously aging. And the other thing is, I don't know if it's the editing or maybe it's the direction. We have certain scenes I felt were missing from this movie, mm. and I don't know why that is. There's a scene where Terrence Howard, as Nelson Mandela, basically says, if they give me the death sentence, we're not going to appeal it. And... She says nothing about she that. She says nothing. She kind of goes... Really, where's that scene? She's got to say something. And then the movie does not give us the climax. Right. She goes in front of this committee to talk about certain things that have happened, and we don't see what she says. Everything's given to us in the text at the end of the credits. And that text went on for quite a bit. Yeah. It wasn't just like one text card. It was like three of them, four paragraphs each. There was a whole lot of story to tell. And I they're know. just like, let's wrap this baby up and tell them what they want to know and send them on their way to a rousing Jennifer Hudson song over the closing credits. Despite some interesting performances, as a film, Winnie Mandela continues to deny justice to the mother of the nation. Skip it. Winnie Mandela has its faults, but it has its merits, most of them because of the winning performances. Stream it. Winnie Mandela is trying to say something, but it fails to be an important work about apartheid. Skip it. Well, our votes add up to half a ticket, which is a skip it for Winnie Mandela. Cheers. Oh, Cheers. Poor Winnie. She'll get over it. She's she's gotten over much worse. I think she can handle she'll, this. She'll be all right. Two lifelong friends lead an idyllic life living at the beach. Yeah, I did all right. But both women find themselves falling in love with each other's sons. Now I feel really sinful. Nothing wrong with that. Resulting relationships threaten their friendship and their families in a door. Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm Leah. And I'm Aaron. And today we're here to talk about the new film starring Robin Wright and Naomi Watts, A Door. We've all just seen it. Got some pretty scandalous stuff going on in this film. What do we think? It's the story of these two gorgeous, hot, middle-aged women who have young adult sons. They've been BFFs for since their own childhood, right? So these are, you know, everybody thinks that they're actually their own couple. Yes. Uh, but what winds up happening is, is that they actually begin having affairs with each other's sons. <gasps> Scandalous. See, it is scandalous, but just it's missing something. Yeah, I, I it's called and, conflict and drama. Yes, yes. Are you the whole oh, movie on, is Kevin. conflict? Okay. There's no conflict okay, 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 at okay. all. There's how do you problem. take it? It's how? internal conflict. Read the novel if you want to hear un internal conflict. Well, it's written by Christopher Hampton, who is a huge playwright, Dangerous Liaisons, and the director Anne Fontaine. And they adapted the short story called The Grandmothers by Doris Lessing. And I think they did a great job of taking 
what could be an 80s sex comedy setup, and they make it a possible real-world scenario and give some depth to it. And I know you don't think there's any depth, but there's a lot going on here. It does give an unbiased look into something that could just as easily be a schmaltzy, over-the-top melodrama. I'll agree with that. I appreciate that it's being told in a straightforward way, but honestly, I think it would have done better with a little melodrama, something to be a little over the top because it's just so flat the whole time that I, I understand that they're having internal conflict. I really do, and I can see it on their faces. I just wish there was a little more for me to latch on to than that. The theme of, you know, why are these women getting involved with each other's sons, clearly that's, like, what the heck are they doing? It's, like, pseudo-incestuous. Right. R right. Cougars are in, and guys dating older guys are in. No, and there's, and, but, the, there's, there's the theme of them being worried that they're going to leave them. I And that's a big thing, that. and, but it's also the kids don't, they, they, they're they thinking to this day. Yeah. They're like, I'm just having sex, and I'm having this affair, and this is great. But they're not thinking about the future, whereas the adult, the older person is going, but what's going to happen in 10 years when you leave me? The look in the mirror with all of the makeup gone, I mean, it's so freaking cliche. It is I've done so, it. <laughs> hence, it's so freaking cliche. But she has a conversation about it. They they talk about it when they're in bed, when Robin Wright is in bed with her lover. You know, she's like, you're not going to like this in 10 years. And he's like, I like you now. And that's the, the, the issue is like, he's only looking to today and he's going to dump this woman when she gets older. And then what is she going to do? My biggest complaint with the film is that where there should be conflict and those moments arrive in the film, things are too easily resolved. Yes. And then you uh, then you find yourself asking the question, well, why was this even a conflict to begin with if it's so easily just papered over? Thankfully, we do have fantastic actresses here. Robin Wright and Naomi Watts do an absolutely incredible job with all the subtlety and, and making us believe that they have some turmoil over what's going on. It could have easily been, I just hate these two women for what they're doing to their yeah. sons. But I didn't. I didn't like what they were doing, but I was so fascinated to, to figure out, why are you doing this to your sons? I found both of their performances very intriguing and compelling, and I'm glad that it was those two women. Yeah. Yes. They look good together. They have great chemistry. You believe that these women yeah. really are good friends and that they care about each other and they support one another. They're beautiful. They're like young gods. Amazing. Yeah. It could have been so much more with better material. I want to see these pristine representations of pure white femininity get a little dirty. I want to see that. Instead, they just kind of come across as some kind of horny middle-aged women, because there's a whole lot of up against the wall going on in this film, <laughs> which you know, was okay. It's like, okay, let's have a little I enjoyed moments. it thoroughly. It was probably the best part of the movie. To but be they didn't go honest. over the top with it. No, not at all. And, not at you all. Know, and I think we credit Anne Fontaine for that. Yeah. She, you know, she tried to keep it as realistic and not as cheesy and corny as it could have been. Production-wise, it's sure. great. I it's mean, beautiful. it's beautiful. The music is awesome. The opening montage sequence yeah, is really, really nice. great. They have, yeah. you know, these very smooth transitions where you're you're looking at them as young girls and then you're, you're on their feet, and then it moves a little bit, and then they're older again. And the yeah. same thing with their sons. It's just right. nice, really beautiful little touches. I think the pacing is a little off. It's just a little too long. But again, with more hefty material, she would have been able to fill out those spaces. Give us a drag. You can have a whole one if you promise to behave yourself. <laughs> a drag will do. We have Xavier Samuel who plays Anne, who is Naomi Watts' son, and James Freshville, who is Robin Wright's son. They're a bunch then of cutie switch. pies. They're cute. I don't think that's, okay. you know, oh my God, they're going to get supporting actor nominations. Yeah. But. The two sons, they do a really good job of exhibiting some conflict. I mean, it makes sense. Little boys have crushes, and they mm -hmm. develop crushes on mommy's friends, and that's, that's really kind of normal. The women, though, they're supposed to know better. Adore is certainly an intriguing film about a taboo subject, and while the performances are strong, I feel there was something missing. It just wasn't dramatic enough, so I say stream it. Clearly there are people all over the planet who are having sex with people that they shouldn't. Adora doesn't really tell us why we should be paying attention to this group. I say skip it. Naomi Watts and Robin Wright give amazing performances that walk a fine line that never crosses into farce, and I found it interesting, so I say see it. Well, our votes add up to one and a half tickets, which is a stream it for a door. Geo.
Did you adore this movie, Kevin? Not I as much did, as Kevin. And yeah. I don't adore you right now. <gasps> oh, you'll get over it. With the film The Grand Master being released, I decided my DVD pick for this week would be the other movie about Bruce Lee's master. Released in 2008, the semi-biographical Ip Man took everybody by surprise, with Donnie Yen playing the titular character with grace, style, and confidence. <laughs> Revolving primarily around the Sino-Japanese War, Ip Man, a very revered kung fu master, goes from a time of stability and calm to a time of war and famine brought by the invading Japanese. This film has some of the most amazing hand-to-hand -hand fight choreography I've ever seen, while also being emotionally taut and rich. Among the many, many movies about this incredible man, Ip Man is the only one that you should see. The Foxfall TV season scares up the headless horseman with the thriller Sleepy Hollow. Puts a new twist on the workplace comedy in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And pits father against son in the situation comedy, Dads. Hi, I'm Salim. I'm Brenna. And I'm Kevin, and we're here to talk about some of the new shows airing on Fox this fall. We've all just seen them. First one is Dads. Salim, what'd you think? So Dads is created by Alex Sulkin and Wesley Wilde, writers on Family Guy, and the show's actually produced by Seth MacFarlane. Now, the comedy, unfortunately, is very much more suited toward cartoon. Now, Seth MacFarlane did do it in TED, but because that's Seth MacFarlane, he knows how to do these types of things. He's very adept and very creative. Unfortunately, these two other guys, they just kind of went for the bare minimum in terms of comedy. The problem with this premise is that we've seen it a million times, and it hasn't been adorable since the 80s, where you have these <laughs> bumbling relatives coming in and ruining everything with their, their lack of tact, making racist jokes and ruining the big deal. The racist jokes aren't even funny. You find yourself more annoyed at them than you find yourself amused I at them. I found myself offended by them. Yeah. Completely. Because they're strewn throughout the entire show, and we're supposed to laugh at them, not because it's, oh my god, they made a racist joke. It's because you're not even quite sure why they're putting the racist joke in there. Yeah. It's to show how weird and kooky the dads are and how inappropriate they are. But, but it's not even done with any kind of style. They're, they're just straight racism. There's, there's, no, there's no funny behind it. And at it's least, not even just the dads. It's, it's the 30-something-year-old the kids. It's, it's the whole show itself. Every every bit of it, you know, the character interactions, the characters themselves, it's very stereotypical. You want to flip for the bed? Dad, there is no way you're sleeping in my head. Heads, 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 heads. See you in the morning. <laughs> Stay out of the bathroom between three and four. That's my go time. Yeah, it stars Seth Green and Giovanni Ribisi, and... Neither of them really have their hearts in it. No. I think Seth Green is adorable. I will always love Seth Green, but even his he acting. Trying. He's, he's trying. He's trying. He is. He's, so hard. But there's points where he's just like phoning it in. Where he's um, just yeah. saying the lines, and yeah. you can tell that he's feels a little uncomfortable yeah. too. And, yeah, and, and I love Seth Green. It's great to see him doing stuff other than Robot Chicken, but, but not this. So what are our final thoughts? Have we uh, mentioned the racism yet? Because hmm. I think we should skip it. It's good to see Seth Green again. Just not in this. Skip it. Um, this show stinks. Skip it. So, I think we should talk about something that we liked a little bit more. How about this new Sleepy Hollow? Sleepy Hollow, created by Alex Kurtzman and Robert Orsi, who did Fringe and Star Trek. Um, I think they did a great job in taking this classic story and updating it to the modern times. I mean, we have Ichabod Crane dying in the American Revolution, but then waking up in 2014, mm -hmm. along with the Headless Horseman. And shenanigans ensue. <laughs> Indeed, and these shenanigans are fun shenanigans, yeah. mm -hmm. right? It's very interesting how they were able to take it and update it and do something that we've seen before. We've mm -hmm. seen the out of, out of time, out of place character and avoid all of the cliches. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't try and fight a, a car and think calling it a dragon. It was <laughs> very believable and it was still funny watching him try and adapt to the modern world. Mm -hmm. And the story itself, the way they ad adapted this story, this old story that we all know, and made it interesting mm -hmm. and, and fascinating, it was great. And it's spooky and creepy and fun. You've been emancipated, I take it? Excuse me? From enslavement. Do you see this gun? I'm authorized to use it on you. 
And unlike dads, we have a very diverse cast here. The lead is a black woman named Nicole Bahari, and she's great. Mm-hmm. She's she's strong, she's vulnerable when she needs to be, and you believe her as this as a sheriff character, as Lieutenant, Lieutenant mm-hmm. Abby. I, I was very shocked. I was not expecting her character. And the fact that the show is as much about her as it is about Ichabod Crane really, really made me happy. But like you said, she she was tough and she had this sense of duty to her that I really I enjoyed because she was just different from other cop, female cops that I've seen on screen. She's very unique. She had a nice backstory and there's complexity to her and there's something going on and I did like at the end how they tied them together and there's a reason that they're kind of going to work together and I like that. And not only did they tie them together, they tied them together specifically for seven for years. For seven years. Seven years, right? right? Clever. I yeah, I know. Let's talk about the, the, the lead, Tom Tom Eisen, who plays uh, Ichabod. He, he's okay. He, he, to me, is just another attractive British guy. I, I don't really see him being different from, from I, other I British actors. I think he's fun. I disagree. I, no, no, I, I mean, thought he was I, quite he's, fun. He's sort of interchangeable attractive, but Tom Eisen could have easily fallen into cliche with this role. He could have been the bumbling, like, oh my goodness, look at this future technology. And instead he just, he seems, he plays a character very smart. The mark on his hand, was it a bow? How do you know that? Oh, no, 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 it can't be. Hey, who is he? When's the last time you saw him? When I cut off his head. It's real believable. I think that helps with because of the writing and the acting. It's just all, it grounds it enough that you believe the world and you, you're already into the world and enjoying it and you want to go with them. And I love the cool factor, the fact that we have the Headless Horseman with the machine gun by the end of this. I, I, was, I was like, this, 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 is, this is what I need. Geeked yeah, yeah. I, I'm on board for Every the rest of it. Every time he would like stand up <laughs> without the head and he turned around, I was like, whoa. Yeah. yeah, it was great. All right, guys, let's get some final thoughts about Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow was a lot of fun, and it's a great twist on an old story. I say see it. I think this could be the coolest show of the new season, so I say see it. It's great to see so many characters of color in the high-concept serial. Definitely see it. Let's take it back to comedy now with Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Brenna, what'd you think? Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a new comedy from the guys who brought us Parks and Rec, Mike Shore and Dan Gore, and it's a police comedy. We haven't had one of those in a while, and it's kind of awesome. We have this very immature but brilliant young detective and this new hard by the books uh, captain coming in and trying to get everybody to grow up and be a family as a as a precinct and how one resists the other and it's it's quite amusing actually. Yeah. No, I I thought it was really funny because we as audience members have seen so much Law and Order, we've seen so many cop shows, so it's fun to see them you know play it for laughs and not being so serious. And I I enjoyed because like I said we we know how these the structure of these t- types of shows are. Um, and seeing the different characters be so well fleshed out and be able to elicit so much humor, it's it's fun. I think it's a fun watch. I think the character of Jake, played by Andy Samberg, he's a little one note for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think they tried to introduce each of the characters, and I get that. It's the pilot. We kind of got very surface type of characters, and I didn't really find them all that interesting. I'm thinking it's going to get more interesting. Like Parks and Rec, it took like a season for it to get mm-hmm. to really gel into an ensemble comedy. And I think this might might be the same. We have Andre Brower here playing the sort of straight man role that he's fam- he made famous in shows like Homicide, Life on the Streets. And it's great because he's still doing it, but he's doing it for laughs this time against other comedic actors, and it works great. This new guy's going to be another robot. Meet Morpsy. Robot captain, engage. Is that what you think? Hey! New captain alert. Don't let me interrupt. I'd like you to finish. Meet Morp. Sarp. That's a terrible robot voice. Yep. The next time I see you, I'd like you to be wearing a necktie. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, final thoughts? It's good to see all the Law & Order tropes that we know and love translated into comedy. Definitely see it. I just love the interaction between this notorious goofball and this notorious straight man. I say see it. I think it has potential. It's just not quite there yet for me, so I'm going to say stream it. All right, so let's have a recap of our votes. Our votes add up to zero tickets, which is a skip it for dads. Our votes add up to three full tickets, which is a see it for Sleepy Hollow. And our votes add up to two and a half tickets for Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is also a see it. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. No dads. No dads. As one of Just Seen It's resident geeks, I was really excited about the science fiction movies coming out this summer, but things didn't quite turn out as I had hoped. So here's a quick sci-fi recap. We started off with Star Trek Into Darkness, and director J.J. Abrams gave us the second installment in this franchise reboot with some great callbacks to the original series. 
Plus, there was a wonderful homage to Raiders of the Lost Ark. We gave it a well-deserved see it. I was authorized to end you. And the only reason why you are still alive is because I am allowing it. Next came After Earth. And while I love Will Smith movies, there was very little of Will Smith in this movie. So we agreed with everyone else and gave it a skip it. And then came Europa Report, a small indie movie that was beautiful and thrilling. Guest reviewer Scott Mance called it an instant sci-fi classic, and we all agreed and gave it a see it. Following up was Pacific Rim from director Guillermo del Toro, which really divided our reviewers. But we ended up giving this robot Godzilla movie a stream it. Gentlemen, your orders are to protect the city of two million people. Then let's go fishing. Finally, there was Elysium, which was just a hot mess. The script was confusing, but nowhere near as confusing as Jodie Foster's performance. We gave it a stream it. So there you have it, a summer of sci-fi movies. Some hits, some misses. So tweet us, go to our website, or go to our Facebook page, and let us know what your picks and pans are. On our next episode, we review the new indie drama, Thanks for Sharing, and then continue to check out the fall TV pilots, just because there's a lot to cover, and we wrap things up and decide if Insidious 2 conjures up some scares. Thanks for watching, and see you next week. What did I say? Park, Park and Rex. Park and Rex. Park and Rex. Park and Rex. <laughs> it's about a boy and his dog. <laughs> <laughs>